Okay, and I think we're streaming everywhere now. Or at least I hope we are. Give it a minute. There it is. Excellent. Great, it's good to see everybody. Hold on just a second. I wanna make sure the chat is here and it's here. Hello to everyone. And for you who are watching and Facebook groups, I'm going to send you a link that will allow me to see your name um, if you comment for me. And that's only for people in Facebook groups. So if you're just watching on regular Facebook or you're on Zoom, um, that doesn't mean anything to you. So that's for you guys who are in um, and Facebook um, groups. So hi to everybody. Oh, I see the chat is laid out a little differently than I'm used to, but I can see your messages coming through. So thank you very much. Give me a minute to get used to the new layout here. All of these software apps change all the time. Um, hello to Mrs. Healy, it's good to see you tonight. And uh, welcome to everyone. It's so good to see everybody. And you know, I have to ask all of you, um, hold on just a second. I'm just rearranging things again because, you know, I'm quite fussy with the way these things are laid out. Um, there, now I can see everybody and everything, I think. I can see messages. Excellent. Okay, thanks for bearing with me there for a second. Um, so thank you everyone for joining me tonight. And I'm just wondering if um, any of you have had the kind of week that I have had. Oh, yesterday I had a chat with my good friend Margo and we were both talking about just what an awful week it's been for both of us. So if any of you have also had one of these awful weeks that you would like to forget about, well, here we are tonight and hopefully with some good company, we'll help each other forget about our awful weeks. And to start you off with how awful my week was, I have a big change to announce for our August, August, April 30th tour. See, I'm, I'm so stressed out from everything. I don't even know what month I'm in. So this is our April 30th tour. We will be going out to commemorate Washington's inauguration. It is the only day of the year it can be done as that was the day he was inaugurated, April 30th. However, you know, I have had some problems with the gentleman and their schedules. And as a result, the gentlemen will not be joining us that day. Um, we will be seeing them on another day. So instead, I'm offering you an afternoon with the ladies and my sister, Mrs. Van R and I will be happy to be your guides for inauguration day. And we will walk through the town together and we will talk about all of the events that occurred in New York City. Um, related to the Revolutionary War that then led to things we find in the Constitution today. It'll be a really fascinating story of how all of that happened. We'll talk about the Constitution and why we got it. We'll even do a little comparison between the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, because there are some interesting things here. We'll talk about um, the arguments throughout the colonies and especially New York against the Constitution. And of course, since the tour is going to be led by the ladies, You'll get lots of good social stories and gossip about who's who in the town, who likes who and who doesn't, and maybe even some stories about a couple of ladies from horrible loyalist families who have returned to New York under the guise of having been great patriots and have found their ways into some of the classiest salons in the town. So Mrs. Van R and I will be sharing all kinds of good stories with you. The tour will end at Federal Hall. And if we have our timing right and we are fortunate, um, we will get there to see General Washington's inauguration, or at least a reenactment of it. So I hope you'll come out and join Mrs. Van R and me. Um, tickets will be on sale tomorrow at patriottoursnyc.com. I hope that those of you in the New York City area will please come in and join us live. I know a lot of you are worried about the city, but honestly, downtown where we'll be walking is in pretty good shape. It's really not that bad. There are not a lot of you know people laying around or bothering you down there. And hopefully it'll be a beautiful spring afternoon. So if you're in the New York City area, please come in and see us live. There will be live stream tickets available as well for those of you, of course, who are too far away. On Saturdays, it's not that hard to park downtown, and there is ample garage parking. And of course, 
all of the restaurants are open as well. So after we finish, everyone can go out and have something to eat and maybe Mrs. Van R and I will join you. So um, we'll see how that all goes, but you can check out tickets tomorrow at Patriot Tours NYC and I'll be posting that link all over social media. So come out and join the ladies for a walk through inauguration day 1789. Um, I promise you it'll be a really special event and we'll all have a wonderful time. Now, also something I want to get through. Oh, look at, uh, oh, Mr. Talmadge likes my hedgehog. Yeah, I am liking this version of my hedgehog better every day. And I even put on a French gown tonight to, to go with my French do. So I hope you're all enjoying that. Um, so I did a little bit of that for some fun tonight. And let's see, we have people from, from Tucson, from Easton, Pennsylvania, Kew Gardens here in New York, and a lot of people that are here every week. Thank you for joining me. So another thing we have to take care of tonight is my hat. You get to vote on the hat you would like best to see me in on April 30th. Now, before I model the hats, let me show you a drawing of the outfit for those of you who have not seen it. So this is a drawing of the top of the outfit. Um, it's blue. The center part is blue and white stripe, and the skirt will be a big white silk skirt. So, and this hair, and the hair might be a little bit bigger by then. So you might have a little bit bigger hair. And I think, I think a couple of very long ponytails down my back for that day. So these are our headgear, our headwear options. Mrs. McCabe, how did ladies in the 18th century curl their hair like this? Curling, curling iron looks lovely. All of those things, Mrs. McCabe, they used a hot iron. Um, they used curlers. They also did, remember those little curls they used to do with the little paper um, where you wet your hair? Well, they would use pomade. Um, but we would wet our hair and then um, roll it up in tissue paper. Mrs. Healy knows what I'm talking about. Roll it up in tissue paper. So you had all the little tissues in your hair. And then when you pulled it out, you got really tight little ringlet curls. I think that was the primary way that they did it at that time was the little wrapping it in the paper curls. Um, they also did use hot irons at that time. And they used um, hot plates to straighten hair too, just like we still do today. So, and some ladies had naturally curly hair. Some of you might know that my real hair is curly just like this. So that's kind of neat. Um, but some ladies had naturally curly hair as well. And uh, so that's how they curl their hair the way we do. Very similar means. Um, so this is what I'll be wearing. And this is the first hat option. Is the silk hat. Let's get the silk hat. So it would be the silk hat. Let me lean down here a little bit so you can see it better. The big silk hat just kind of sitting on top of the hedgehog. And although you might think this ribbon doesn't match the outfit, in my time, we're not as concerned with matching patterns as you are in your time. Or I just might get some blue and white ribbon and change the ribbon on it. So this is option number one, is the big, I can puff it up a little more, my cat was probably sitting on it, is the big puffy, I mean, leaning back, the big puffy blue silk hat. Very nice, one of my favorites. That's option number one. Option number two is the straw hat. So we can also do the straw hat. As you can see it here, side to side. We can also do the straw hat with all the curls under the straw, which might be nice for spring. Straw hat, I think will be easier for me to attach to my head than the blue hat with all the curls, but they found a way then so I can find a way now. So this is option number two. So let me know, let me adjust these here. Let me know in the comments, let me see what everyone likes. Which hat do you like? Oh, Mrs. Healy likes the straw. Yes, pin curls they were called. Let me see. Um, what else do people like over here? Um, let me know which hat you like better in the comments. I probably, as you know, will leave the final judgment up to you and up to Mrs. Van R, who you know has an impeccable fashion sense. So if Mrs. Van R has a strong feeling either way for either hat, that is the likely direction I will go as she is much better at these things than I am. Oh, we're getting the votes. Um, straw hat 
Um, someone says a lot of frizzing and teasing. Yes, a lot of frizzing and teasing. And uh, oh, hello to Manassas, Virginia. Um, oh, the collar. This is lovely lace collar that I made out of two layers of very nice lace from India that I bought from a gentleman who sells direct from India and the silk came from India also. Um, so people like the straw. Okay, so maybe it will be the straw hat. Yes, blue for inauguration day, um, blue and white. It'll be very, it'll be very nice. And also some of you have responded to my um, reminder about my book about Theodosia Burr which is an excellent gift for Women's History Month. And here are a couple pages from it. And if you're interested in a signed copy of my book, you can get in touch with me on social media or email. Um, buy it from me because I will sign it and ship it to you um, for the same price you'll get it on Amazon and you'll get it signed and personalized from me. So uh, let me know if you would like a book. Go with the straw will be easier to deal with the weather unless it's a very windy day. Last year, for inauguration day, I wore this gown and the straw hat. It was incredibly windy. I could not keep the silk on this dress down because it's very light. The silk just kept billowing up all over the place. The hat was everywhere. It was quite amusing. My good friend Ariel Vieira of Urbanist was live streaming. <laughs> it was lots and lots of fun. This outfit will be a little more secure. Um, by the way, if you don't already know that outfit, we'll have what's called the bum roll or bum pillow, which will make the skirt billow out quite big uh, and, and beautifully um, underneath that uh, pleated jacket. So it should be quite lovely outfit. And I do not know what Mrs. Van R is going to wear, but I don't have to worry about it at all because she will look lovely, whatever the choice is, you can be sure. And let me go back to the background. A plain background. So one of the things I wanted to talk about tonight are some of the ladies of early New York who are very inspirational and not remembered very well in your time and maybe not even in my time so much. So I thought I would talk about two of those ladies tonight and uh, let you know about them and see what you think about them. Um, Michigan. Hello. It's nice to see you. Good evening. And um, oh, Mr. White remembers the live stream from last year and my skirt flying everywhere. Oh, it was kind of fun. Um, so I'd like to talk to you about two women tonight who were foundational in early New York. Oh my goodness, I can see, you can see some cleavage here. Let me tell you these new stays, as I said last week, really do put everything in the right place. I'm trying to pull this up a little bit to be a little bit more modest here. Um, but these stays definitely put everything in the right place. But I was only a bit younger. Um, um, okay, so, oh, Mrs. McFarland likes the white hat. I think maybe you mean the blue hat, this one, the blue hat. So we'll see. We'll see when the outfit, when the outfit is finished, I'll post both hats with the outfit on my dummy on social media. And you can all tell me what you think with the hats with the outfit. Um, so I would like to talk about, as I mentioned, these two ladies who really were foundational to New York. And I know that, you know, as time went by and in your time, it's kind of an idea that early ladies in colonial America really had no role. They kind of disappear. And that is true to a great degree that even when I do research, I have trouble finding out about some of the women. For instance, when I wrote my book about um, Theodosia Burr, her mother had five children before her. And it's very easy to find out everything about the two sons because they were men. It's very difficult to find out anything about the three girls. There's very little written record about those three girls. So unless you come from a highly esteemed family or the woman in some way does something to be remembered, a lot of the women are forgotten from that time. These two I'm going to tell you about, however, are not. And for anyone who has studied New York history, the names will probably be familiar to you. Let me see. Um, people are le loving my hair. And thank you. I look stunning as ever. Thank you so much for that. Um, thank you. I appreciate it. It's very kind of you. Um, I do this for you every week because I know you enjoy it. And I enjoy it as well. I don't look like this every day. It would be great if I did. Oh, and another announcement before I forget, those of you who've been watching me for a long time and remember our wonderful Q dog 
who would, you know, serenade us with his barking and howling and go back and forth under the green screen. Mr. Q and I will be adding a dog to our home in June, and I'll be happy to introduce you to him when he arrives. Um, we have selected a name, and his name will be Quintus Maximus Q. A wonderful name. Our last dog was Lancelot du Lac for the French Knight of the Arthurian Tales. And of course, Quintus Maximus is in honor of two great Roman generals. Um, uh, women were seen and not heard. Um, Miss Aquilino, not in New York. I shared a story with Mrs. Van R. the other day that I found of a gentleman who visited from England, and he said he got so tired of listening to the men speak of nothing but politics in the coffee houses and taverns that he decided to go to a ladies' tea, and he said the ladies were worse. So the ladies in New York have always been something to be reckoned with. Um, so, oh, Mrs. Langdon, hello, Mrs. Langdon. Oh, Miss Arseri. Friend from Setauket. I see a number of my friends from Setauket. By the way, I will be going for a visit to Setauket and um, you will be invited to join me there. I will be doing a tour. I will be taking a tour of Setauket given by my friend, Mr. Benjamin Talmadge, and uh, tickets will be on sale for that as well when we pick a date and you can come out to Setauket and see us together. And that I think we'll have a live stream as well, but it would be much more fun for you to come out to Setauket. I have a whole number of these wonderful live events planned for you for the summer to come out and join Mrs. Q. Also the Reformed Church in Staten Island, uh, what else am I going to be doing? Oh, and of course, a trip to Tappan to walk the route. Major Andre's final day on earth. We'll be doing that as well. Now that everyone's out and everything's open, we can do all of these things. This new chat is really nice. Will you call him Max for short? Um, no, there are too many German shepherds named Max. So he will be Quintus or Quint, but he will not be Max because there are too many of them. So no Max. Um, huh, so yeah, nice, nice comments. So let us continue. It's so easy for me to get off track, especially now that I'm getting older. You should see that the way I get distracted. So the first lady we will talk about tonight is, and I had to take some notes, excuse me, but this is more than 100 years ago. And although the fine ladies, like my mother in her time and my sister can remember impeccably these family trees going back more than 100 years. I cannot. And I'll tell you a secret so that I don't make any mistakes in my shop. I keep a book in my shop with everyone who's related to everyone. <laughs> So I won't make a mistake about who is sister or sister-in-law or mother-in-law or grandmother to whom. Um, my sister keeps it all in her head, but I don't. So I keep a little cheat book. So I have some little cheat notes with me here tonight as well. Now, this is not the lady, but this is how I imagine she might have appeared on a winter's day. And this is a Dutch woman in winter attire. And you can see that she is covered with beautiful beaver furs, lovely clothes, gorgeous shoes, and on her face, a mask to shield her face, not only from the cold, but the glaring sun. As you know, ladies did not want to be tanned in any way because being tanned showed that you worked for a living and you did not want to look like you worked. So you stayed as untanned as possible. So she's wearing the sun mask on her face. And I can imagine that this might have been Margaret Hardenbrook, um, an early lady who arrived here from the Netherlands in her 20s. Um, I think she arrived in the 1650s. And she arrived and worked as a business agent for various Dutch companies who were trading here in New Amsterdam. She was um, very assertive, very capable, expanded her business and became a very wealthy woman. She married Rodolphus van Cortland, of course, another Dutchman, and you may know of the Van Cortland family, and uh, you may also know um, Van Cortland Manor in Upper Manhattan or Cortland Street in Lower Manhattan, named for them. So a, 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 a well-known family that she married into, and she had one daughter with Mr. Van Cortland, and that daughter 
was Mr. John Jay's grandmother, um, Mr. John Jay, um, the Jay family marrying into the Van Cortland family and the many other marriages in the Hudson Valley at the time. So Margaret was Chief Justice John Jay's great grandmother through the daughter she had with Mr. Van Cortland. Now he died young and she remarried and her second marriage was to Frederick Philippe's, a very successful and wealthy merchant. It was not long after that that New York came under British rule. And so Margaret could no longer own her property or her wealth herself. And that all became the holdings of her husband, um, Frederick Philippe's, who promised that her daughter would have her rightful inheritance um, when he became her stepfather. Um, so he made that promise to um, Margaret and he kept that promise. Oh, excuse me. Oh, allergies, my face is so itchy. Excuse me, not to be rude. I'm so itchy. And um, they have four more children together. And through their oldest son, Philip, um, they became grandfather to Frederick Philippe II, who you may know, know would be the Lord of Philipsburg Manor, which today is where Yonkers is in New York City. Um, Philipsburg Manor was a massive estate on the Hudson River. And um, Frederick Philippe and, Mar and Margaret created a massive trading empire together. He was one of those gentlemen of that time, the 1600s, who appreciated a capable wife. And between his merchant contacts and her agent contacts, they built a massive trading empire together um, so that their grandson, um, Frederick Philippe, became a great and wealthy man building Philipsburg Manor. Now, through all of these marriages, oh, excuse me, through all of these marriages that I don't want to get into because they are so complicated, I'll only tell you that the Philippes, through one of their daughters, one of their sons who married a Brockholst, became relatives to the Livingstons, who you all know. Of course, Mr. William Livingston being father-in-law to John Jay. So you can see how these Families are somewhat intermarried here. But the interesting thing is that the Livingstons, of course, will be rebels and patriots, with William Livingston being the first rebel governor of New Jersey, and uh, will be instrumental in the separation from England. Not so with the Philippe's family, who will remain loyalists throughout and be stripped of all of their property holdings by the rebels in America. Um, they will take their wealth and uh, move to England and not return. So that is the story of the Philippe's family, but who through the Revolutionary War were one of the wealthiest, most powerful families in New York. Some of you may have um, visited Phillipsburg Manor in Yonkers. It's a lovely stone home from the 1600s that's still standing there and that is a historical landmark in your time. So Ma uh, Margaret Hardenbrook, one of the first ladies to come from Holland and set up business herself. And of course, now being the matriarch of the great um, Philippe's family. And, you know, I saw a letter once between John Jay's wife, Sarah Livingston, and Mary Philippe's, who I thought at the time were best friends. It turns out they were indirectly cousins, but best friends with Mary Philippe's writing to Sarah Livingston saying she regretted that she was unable to attend her good friend's wedding to Mr. J as her father would not allow her to come to the city. He thought the temperatures were too high. Thought it was too hot for her and she was not allowed to attend her good friend's wedding. And it was shortly after that that the Philippe's moved to London. And I don't know if Sarah and Mary ever saw each other again. It's possible Sarah may have seen her when Jay was over there working as a diplomat, perhaps if Mary Philippe's had been traveling to France or Spain, but there's no note anywhere that they ever saw each other again after that separation. So very sad thing between those two girls. I'm gonna take a look at some of these. Um, the Livingstons come full circle. Everyone's married to everyone. So, you know, when the war broke out, it was very difficult as many of these families were intermarried or the ladies were married to men who fought on opposite sides or whose fathers were on opposite sides and the ladies were good friends. So it was very difficult as these families divided up through the Revolutionary War and some of the families being stripped of their property as a result. 
um, like the Philippe's family. And somewhere I have the, the notice of them um, being stripped of their property rights. I have that, that official notice somewhere. Um, let's see. Did the men like the British rule of women not owning property? Obviously not that man. Uh, you know, again, that is going to be family to family and depending on who the men were. Of course, you know, you're going to get men now who are going to marry women um, for their property inheritance. And I, I don't know if any other colony had this rule, but in New York, a man could not dispose of the property he gained as his wife's inheritance without the written permission of his wife. And that permission had to be um, out of his presence and in the presence of lawyers that represented her um, to try to mitigate any influence he could have over her. How successful that was, you know, again, I don't know. Um, but eventually, of course, women would be would come to own their own property in New York. I've been trying to find out exactly when that occurred. I don't think it's that long after Washington's inauguration that that happens, that women can own their property. But I've been trying to find out when we were granted the right to own our property. And you know that me as Mrs. Q have inherited my father's property, the home I live in, the store I run, all of it was inherited from my father and is at least legally the property of Mr. Q, who's sitting over there in the next room. Uh, so is not mine, but is his. Um, so um, that will take some time to work out. And again, the ladies were not, many of them not happy about that British rule uh, um, and the way that happened. And they were lost the rights to their property to their nearest male relatives. So it could be a son, could be a brother, could be their father. Um, like that, the, the, you know, the British looked at women as the property of the male family member. Um, so property couldn't own property. Um, um, Mrs. Kaler says women not having their own money is just wrong. You'd never know if the man would blow it. Of, of course, of course. And that was the problem that you wanted to secure your wealth that way. You know, in England, the oldest son inherited all of the family wealth. Um, some of you have watched any of these wonderful old uh, English dramatic series. You've seen that. And um, in America, the men didn't necessarily leave um, their wealth to their oldest son if he was irresponsible. They might leave it to a younger son or divide it among their children, which was different. Um, people who work for their wealth want to make sure that that wealth and property is maintained and are more likely to leave it to the child most likely to maintain it for future generations. And as you know, in England, that wasn't true. And sometimes the oldest son would just uh, drink away or gamble away everything. Um, the great novel Wuthering Heights is all about that. It's a wonderful story, Wuthering Heights, about um, Heathcliff and how he does that, how he loses everything. Um, kind of like a prenuptial agreement, the, the father and the prospective um, husband or suitor um, would have a legal negotiation over the administration of that property, especially if it was a lot of property. So there would be some sort of legal arrangement that would be made on paper that both parties would be signatory to. Um, that at least was the situation with my father and Mr. Q, um, making sure that my father's hard work and property would um, continue into future generations or at least be disposed of in any way I would want it disposed of, or, and my sister. Um, my sister, of course, brilliantly married into massive wealth and does not have these worries. Her husband is wonderful. Mrs. Va Mr. Van R gives her everything she wants. And if you were here a few weeks ago, you saw her lovely French parlor he built for her. And we'll have to have to join you again some night from that beautiful little French parlor only for the ladies to enjoy. Um, so he is very good to her and she has no worries in that respect. We need a bit of water. <clears throat> My father, of course, was a brilliant man. He educated both of his daughters. So what, what more can I say? Um, the next lady we would like to talk about is one you have heard me speak about before. And she is not just foundational to New York, um, to New York in the 18th century, but she is a part of everything happening in the 18th century. And that is Mary Spratt Provo. 
Alexander or Mrs. Alexander, mother of Major General Lord Sterling. So this is quite a story for us to tell. Um, Mary came from, again, a family of merchants. And on the Dutch side, some of them were lady merchants. Again, um, all of the men took over running all of the business in her, their family. But she ran her own business here in New York prior to the Revolutionary War, although it was all in the name of her son, William Alexander, who some of you know as Major General Alexander or Lord Sterling. Now, Mary Alexander, Mrs. Alexander, wasn't just a wealthy merchant. Um, her, her fortune was in the tens of millions of dollars, but it was said during that time that there was not a ship in a dock in New York that did not have goods bound for Mary Alexander's store. So she was um, quite proficient in stocking her stores and having a great deal of stock. You can see from the picture of her, though, there is no formal portrait of her, um, just a pencil drawing someone did that she was a very modest lady, although she had quite a nice mansion that she lived in and quite a lot of money. Now, she isn't the only um, significant person in her family of that time. Her husband, James Alexander, was a prominent lawyer and one of the lawyers who defended John Peter Zanger in the trial of 1735, which established freedom of the press here in the colony of New York. James Alexander being one of those two lawyers. He was disbarred from representing Mr. Zanger, but still in actuality ad advised him and the lawyer who advised him. One of our greatest lawyers, James Alexander. Um, his partner, William Smith, um, they taught a young lawyer named William Livingston, who you may know then taught a young lawyer named John Jay. Now, why is her son called Lord Sterling? Well, the Alexanders, or he through his father's line, were the rightful inheritors of the land of Stirling, Scotland. You may remember when the English took Scotland, they removed all of the Scottish lords from their land and granted it to British peers instead. And at that time, many Scottish lords, um, Scottish families lost the right to their property. Um, the Alexanders came to America and they're actually from around Morristown, New Jersey, where they settled and over <laughs> near Mrs. Healy. And over time, young William Alexander, Mary's son, thought it was time for them to reestablish their rightful ownership of Sterling. And he hired lawyers in England and attempted to do this to show paperwork and everything needed to establish that his, his father and thus he was the rightful Earl of Sterling. His case was brought before the House of Lords. Of course, they turned it down as they were not going to take that property away from one of their own and grant it to him. So he was denied that right. But just about that time, our Continental Congress was meeting. And to spite the English, they voted unanimously to make William Alexander the Earl of Sterling. He is the only gentleman in America to ever um, acquire a title of peerage from our Congress. And it was more just a title of harassing the British than of real peerage. And you will find um, that when Washington wrote to him, he did address his letters many times to my dear friend, Major General Lord Sterling. So if you are like I was once and you were reading about the American Revolution and you're wondering who is this Lord Sterling guy um, fighting for the English, that was William Alexander, um, Mary Alexander's fine son. Um, so Mary Alexander is right in the middle of everything in the mid 18th century. She is a force to be reckoned with in the Chamber of Commerce and the business community here, as well as her husband being one of the finest lawyers in New York and her son being a great general in the Revolutionary War. So we have Mary Alexander, another great lady who I'm sure did not agree with the idea that women were seen and not heard. Oh, another lady. I wasn't planning to talk about her, but another lady who certainly made herself heard was the great Mrs. Schuyler, or Kitty Catherine Van Rensselaer Schuyler, mother to Elizabeth and Angelica, um, mother-in-law to Mr. Alexander Hamilton. It is no secret that Mrs. Schuyler, or Miss Van Rensselaer, um, was a formidable lady of the Hudson Valley who ran multiple households um, 
like clockwork and ruled over all of her family and and property and servants with an iron hand. Um, it is not Mr. Schuyler that Mr. Hamilton fears, but Mrs. Schuyler, I assure you. So another great lady, Mrs. Schuyler, who in the midst of running multiple properties, and, and by running them, I mean making sure all of the bills are paid, making sure all of the finances are handled, making sure all of the animals are cared for, the crops are planted and taken in, everything is put away for the winter, the children are all clothed, everyone is clothed, I should say, and the children are educated in Dutch, English, French, and the basics of reading, writing, and math and geography. So Mrs. Schuyler, it, an incredible lady of her time and almost legendary in Hudson Valley circles. So a third one to add. So we have Margaret Hardenbrook, um, Mary Alexander, and um, Mrs. Van Rensselaer Schuyler, or um, Kitty Van Rensselaer, as she was known. Um, and while she was doing all of that, she managed to give birth to 16 children. The last, I think, since she was about 40, or maybe a couple of years beyond 40 years old, eight of whom lived fully, full lives as adults. So quite a formidable lady. So those are some of our New York ladies. I can assure you, Mrs. J is a quite capable lady as well, um, not only socially, but intellectually. Mrs. J, of course, being the daughter of William Livingston, who we all know educated all of his daughters as well as his sons. So Mrs. J, another lady, um, a force to be reckoned with in our new country, in our new city, America. Let me look at some of your um, um, comments here. I see um, somebody's talking about the Scots. Oh, Mr. Linden tells me, thank you, sir, that it's the New York Married Women's Property Act, and it is not until 1848. So let's boo that. New York was a bit slow to come around on a number of things, weren't we? The Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, embarrassingly freeing our slaves, which took decades too long to accomplish and is quite a blot on our great state and city's history. And as I see here, granting the right to women to own property, not until 18 and 48. So um, a few things we might want to quibble with New York about, you know, New York always wanting to represent itself as so progressive in our thinking. Oh, is that why Hamilton looks so unhappy on the money? Um, the women were strong, absolutely very strong women and who, rate, who, who birthed and had children as well um, during that time. Some of our founding mothers, I'm sure, had a shoebox with their own money in it. <laughs> that, that is possible, you know, a lot of Spanish dollars uh, socked away um, for another day or a rainy day. And um, so many ladies, I'm sure, putting away some uh, money of their own to spend. And some of the husbands, of course, if they have the money, are very generous with that. And some are not. And, and it all depends. And, you know, even though we might think of the women of the Hudson Valley who are um, the wives of farmers or the daughters of farmers or, or, or artisans or things like that, you know, the young ladies did needlework and sold it. Young ladies were highly valued for their needlework, for their embroidery. And you might know that they sewed something called a sampler, which was a sample of their needlework, letters and numbers, animals and plants that they would show as an example of their fine needlework. And they would take in work doing that and keep, if they could, you know, if the family, you know, could afford them to, might keep some of that money for themselves or put it away for their dowry in the future. Remember, when girls go into marriage, they go into marriage with a trunk full of all kinds of things they'll need as married ladies. Um, you know, chemise, like I'm wearing a very plain one under here, but maybe much more um, fancy chemise that they could wear under their clothes or to sleep in, um, maybe um, a couple of dresses and skirts, perhaps some stays, um, band linens, um, all of these things, pockets. Um, and I don't know if you know, um, the pockets we wear under our clothes can be very ornately embroidered, not mine because I don't care. 
This is Van Arweer's lovely pockets. Mine are just plain pockets. Who sees them anyway? I'm very practical about these things. But some young, some girls sewed pockets, sewed embroidery on pockets, or sewed embroidery on some of those beautiful ball gowns that you see ladies wearing, um, or just um, embroidered initials into things for people. So there were um, there was needlework that girls could do and put away some of the money they earned for their own future and various types of things. As you know, my sister started out um, as a mantua maker sewing dresses with my mother, and that was how she met her future husband by being um, so beautiful and sociable and her beautiful sewing skills got her into social circles. <laughs> I would have never, I freely admit I get invited to social things that I personally would never get invited to if I was not Mrs. Van, our sister. I freely admit that and I am not embarrassed one bit. And we might talk about that a little bit on our tour on April 30th. How <laughs> this is Van R is my way into social circles. I might not be welcome in otherwise. So we'll talk a little bit about how that works and who marries whom and what kinds of doors that may open for you. Let me see. Um, didn't know they had time to do needlework. Needlework was um, really a part of most girls' lives, mostly all Oh, thank goodness for my phone. only young lady of my time I know who doesn't know needlework is Theodosia Burr, who did not learn any needlework because she was too busy studying Latin and Greek geography, math and literature. So she did not learn needlework. But that is a primary part of a young lady's education, um, doing needlework. And some ladies will do needlework and, you know, recite things um, while they're working and learn that way. Quite a lot of learning is recitation, right? Someone reads and you recite it back. So quite a bit of learning is that can kind of you might call it multitasking. Um, Ms. Marzoff says her grandmother um, actually had a dowry chest for me. She had linens and dish sets for me when I got married. That is wonderful. That is so wonderful. I have the dowry cedar chest that was one of my grandma would be great grandmothers, one of my mother's grandmothers. I think it was my mother's maternal grandmother's cedar chest. And I still have that. That is a beautiful chest. Although it came to me from my mother empty. <laughs> um, what else? Um, don't forget, absolutely no washers and dryers. So everything is hand done. So as I've said before, the outer gowns will not be laundered as much as the inner chemise is laundered. So that is the regular laundry. And the stays, of course, also don't fit against your skin. So those are often not laundered maybe at all or very irregularly. Only what you would wear right next to your body will be regularly laundered. So stockings, your chemise or your bed gown, um, but the outer things, you know, only laundered if they are, are really dirty. So laundering is, you know, quite a task, right? And um, very difficult to do. And, you know, if you go to a reenactment, you'll see the ladies uh, boiling the pot of water and putting lie in it and all of the linen and muslin uh, tunics for the men to uh, get the dirt out and get them white and then hanging them up to dry. Very, um, very difficult work. So um, no washing machines, no dryers, no heat, no air conditioning, no refrigeration, no noise. Think of all of the noise everything in the modern world generates um, that didn't exist in the 18th century. I think of that sometimes. Um, the lack of ambient lighting at night and the lack of noise and how different it, it must have been without the noise. Um, lace making, yes, if the women could make lace, absolutely. Anything, I see something about samplers. Samplers today from back then are very valuable. Um, some of the museums have some lovely um, samplers. I did a social media post about it some time ago. I can do that again. I have some pictures of some of them. They're quite impressive, some of the work that the ladies did, some of the needlework they did, you know, illustrating um, events and, and things, just really lovely work. You know, and sometimes I think about that as a 21st century woman or an 18th century woman, that I think the fashions of the 21st century to a Mrs. Q would seem 
you know, so drab and uninteresting and uncomplimentary to being a lady and, you know, without ornamentation and uh, without, um, you know, without like the beautiful color change that this silk does or the beautiful draping that was done at that time. I think um, our fashions today might seem, you know, quite boring and uninteresting to that time. And uh, I think also maybe the architecture and much of the art would seem um, because of the lack of ornamentation in the 21st century versus the 18th century. I mean, even look at, you know, the curtains in this room and even this little, this little um, thing here to shield you from the, from the fire is just beautifully made. So uh, all of these things are quite different. Mrs. Kaler says the clothes we have in 2022 are awful. Um, Mrs. Aquilino says young girl samplers often had Bible quotes, their name and age, etc. I, I saw one that had all little farm animals on it. So uh, beautiful things like that. People, um, um, sampler might show a whole family and their home and where they live. I saw one that was someone's entire home with the family standing in the garden. Very beautifully done. Um, so maybe in the 21st century, that type of work is not as appreciated as it should be, as it is uh, very difficult to do, as any of you who do embroidery in your time know, it's difficult to do. And of course, no lights. So you are working by natural light or by candlelight or oil lamp light at night. So um, no nice bright lights to work under either. So it's nice in the warm weather to sit outside and do that work under the sun where you have natural lighting. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Lots of comments tonight. Thank you so much for being involved. I really like it when you're also um, active and involved in comments. Right. Um, and, and someone, Mrs. Aquilino, thinks women today think they're busy. The women at that time were super women. Well, you know, it was well known, at least in, you know, families that where everyone had to work in order to, you know, survive, that the women were the first up in the morning, often before the sun was up. And they were the last to bed at night, often after everyone else was in bed. So in a working family, um, the woman's life was very hard and her day was very long. So yes, these women were um, very respectable and I think formidable. You know, there, there was no free time like we have uh, today, every minute of the day was filled up with necessary activity. So the ladies of the 18th century who have time, you know, to learn Latin and Greek and to get their hair pin curled and these kinds of things, you know, these are ladies from family with some money um, where the young ladies don't have to do anything like that. So they do have free time in order to do this. You know, if you visit a farm, the woman working on the farm is not going to have her hair all pin curled up in this hedgehog hairstyle. You know, she'll have it, you know, back in a bun um, with a bonnet over it because there simply is no time for that. You know, this, this is time consuming. Ladies in my time, fine ladies in my time, are not up and dressed like this before 11 in the morning or even noon. So this is a whole, you know, for fine ladies, the morning is a whole ritual, um, a toilet ritual, as it's called, that begins with getting up, um, maybe having a light breakfast in your bedgown, looking at the paper, you know, talking to your family members, and then you begin your whole, you know, thing, fixing your hair, putting on your makeup, picking your dress, putting on your dress, you know, all of this takes time. So in my shop, I don't see fine ladies before 11 a.m. because they're simply not out yet. And they could be out until very late. So my hours tend to be later in the morning until later at night, um, because that is the clients that I serve. Although I am up a bit earlier and dressed myself to be in the shop. The gentlemen are up earlier, but you know, no lady, a proper lady is seen early in the morning um, because we're just not ready to be seen early in the morning. Certainly not Mrs. Van R. Mrs. Van R. would never take a guest before oh, 1 p.m., perhaps noon if it's someone she knows well, but a formal guest certainly not before 1 p.m., really. Um, oh, so Ellen likes the red, white, and blue I'm wearing. You know, the silk is really pink, but under this light, it's appearing red. Um, this is a lovely silk that appears different colors. And just my little blue ribbon to break up the lace a little bit. Um, let's see. 
So thank all of you so much for joining me again tonight. I'm sorry if I didn't get to your comments. I'm looking at trying to go through the comments. Were arranged marriages a thing? They were, but more and more falling out of favor in America, the arranged marriage. And um, because of the Presbyterian beliefs of many people, um, we find more and more marriage for love and companionship and for religious similarity, religious belief, than we find as arranged marriages. So by the end of the Revolutionary War, those are, are, are falling out of favor, the old English style of arranged marriages. Um, Dating was interesting then, of course, dating in my time is not like your time. People meet at social events with chaperones. Um, there's a proper time for the young men and young ladies to come out in society, as we call it, and they begin attending social events with their older sisters, perhaps, or their mothers as a chaperone, perhaps their grandmothers are there, or aunts, um, always chaperoned companionship. And uh, if a young lady takes a liking to a young gentleman who is not, let's say, a good character, um, the people in that social group will be sure to tell her about it. So a very safe environment for our young people to meet each other in a group environment. If you have something in the future called online dating, that I'm really not so sure about. Um, let me see. So we have, oh, a family of the Bristows in Virginia near Manassas were stripped of their land. Um, they were living in England. Mrs. Bristow's made a personal plea to George Washington and not sure how it ended. I doubt George Washington could have done anything to get them their land back. He was certainly persona non grata with the English, wasn't he? <laughs> he was not on the English friends list, that is for sure. Um, someone says like ice cream socials. Is it true that some women owned taverns? Well, of course we had um, Mrs. Montaigne's Tavern near the Commons, regular um, place for the Sons of Liberty to meet in the name of, of course, her husband, but she ran that tavern. And um, Mrs. Francis ran, you know, Mr. Sam Francis owned a number of establishments, one run by his wife. Um, so it was not unusual to see ladies running taverns and boarding houses as well. There was Mrs. Underhill, um, who you might know was Mr. Woodhull of Setauket's sister, uh, Mary Underhill. So um, there were ladies who ran things, but again, until 1848. And between 1664, I should say, and 1848, they could not own them. Um, Oh, at some point, country dances were outlawed in England. That is something I would love to do is put on an 18th century social event. And I have been talking to some people about perhaps doing something just like that with getting some musicians, getting a fiddler, doing some period music, and maybe having a little fair with things for sale to raise money um, for a historic landmark. So I'm thinking about doing that and just having some people come in period attire so that we could see um, maybe what an outdoor event might have been like at one of the pleasure gardens. So I'm considering doing something like that. I think you might like to attend that. Some of you might like to do something like that. Um, so I have to say good night. You're all still commenting. Thank you so much. But I have to get on um, to do something with Mr. Q. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. I will be back next Friday. And as I said, come out to see Mrs. Van R and me. Those of you who haven't met Mrs. Van R, you know she is a lovely lady. And uh, you can talk to us along the tour route and we'll have a wonderful afternoon um, reminiscing about George Washington's inauguration and what was happening in the town that day and how we became the United States of America. So a little bit of learning, a little bit of fun, a little bit of gossip <laughs> and a little bit of reenactment for you. So, um, and I think that tour will begin at 1230 on April 30th and we'll end uh, the inauguration begins at two. So we'll get to Federal Hall by two. So thank you all so much. I'll see you on social media or in my email newsletter and um, we'll see which hat I wear. Thank you very much and have a wonderful weekend, a safe and lovely week and I'll see you all next Friday. Thank you.
Thank you all for your comments. Thank you so much.